start talks with um, uh, a little indicator of where the, where the Isle of Man is. You, know, you would not believe the number of people who think that uh, we're located off um, uh, two ports in the middle of the south coast of, of England, namely Portsmouth and Southampton, but uh, I think I'm in more uh, educated uh, company today. So. Um, my starting point in undertaking these investigations has been a, a growing dissatisfaction, really, with the assumptions made by uh, an otherwise knowledgeable local public on the island about this aspect of, uh, of their cultural heritage. Um, there seems to be a surprising resistance to new data and, indeed, to new ideas about the early Christian period on the Isle of Man. Uh, to a degree, I think, perhaps it's based on a uh, a, a reverence for, uh, for past scholars. In recent years, though, I've begun uh, investigating the physical remains of uh, the chapels, or keels, as we uh, prefer to call them, and I'm in the process now of drawing that, to get that new information together in readiness for, for publication. This session, however, has presented an opportunity to readdress uh, issues of location and distribution of the keels, which have long dogged uh, revisionist study of these classic Manx buildings. Let's begin by looking at what we think we know. Uh, here we have uh, a classic keel site, site of, uh, of Keel Vale at Balladool. Uh, those of you interested in Viking greys will know that at the other end of this hilltop there is uh, a fantastic uh, Viking Age uh, ship burial. But what we're looking at uh, here is uh, a rectangular building orientated east-west with its door in the south wall and it measures about five by three metres internally. So that's what we think we know. Let's look at what the Manx Archaeological Survey, which for those of you who don't know, only ever looked at keels and burial grounds. They, 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 uh, they ran out of energy, let's say, um, after dealing with uh, so many of them. Um, this is what the Manx Archaeological Survey has actually been telling us for a hundred years. These buildings are extraordinarily diverse. Um, diverse in shape, diverse uh, in, in form, and uh, most particularly diverse in size. And once you get beyond the simple linear measurement to the internal area of these buildings, that has significant ramifications for how they were potentially used, were they congregational or, or not. You know, if you look at uh, dimensions of, of eight by five meters, for, for some of these buildings compared with three by two and a half meters for the smallest, you're dealing with the difference between 40 square meters internally and 7.5 square meters. There's a vast difference there. We also have the issue of the physical evidence for the keels in terms of the presence of cold, hard archeological remains. And most certainly, Philip Kermode, the, uh, the main author of the Max Archaeological Survey, didn't help things, as this quotation shows. He advances the assumption right from the word go that wherever you have burials, you have chapels. Nor indeed did Karl Marstrander, who took a, an approach to the, uh, the existence and location of the keels based on uh, a landholding unit, this, uh, this term, tree. And he tried very hard to fit the facts to the story that he wanted to put out. Now, I'm not finding fault here. It's something that, you know, quite frankly, I think we all know was, uh, was fairly customary at the time. But we come to the numbers. Tangible archaeological evidence exists for between 125 and at most 130 keels. That's roughly two-thirds and no more 
of all these primary land holdings uh, spread across the island that actually possess one of these chapels. I'm currently in the process of reviewing all of our national archaeological records for these sites, so this is actually right up to the minute uh, um, numbering. Certainly we can go a little bit beyond this figure if we, uh, uh, if we bring in other evidence. Take for example uh, the, uh, the farm or the site of Bala Kill Ferrick, the farm of the chapel of Patrick. The name does what it says on the tin. You know, we have clear uh, place name evidence for a farm that was made individual by the presence of, of a chapel. Um, there's absolutely no archaeological evidence for, for a building. Uh, there's absolutely no local memory of where it actually stood but there's stacks and stacks of burials spread across about a hectare of land which uh, have been uh, exposed uh, casually through agriculture. So there's certainly, there's certainly that suggestion that if you've got the place name and if you've got the cemetery, then, then there should be a building somewhere. It's just we cannot see it archaeologically. Maybe these figures then, using evidence like that, can be pushed perhaps towards uh, 140, and perhaps if we evoke just the presence of cemeteries, we can push that figure a little bit further towards 160. But we're still short of that magic figure that places one of these chapels in each and every one of these land holdings. Now all of this sounds desperately like a kind of numbers game and about dots on the map, um, so I'd like to tease out for a, for a few minutes some of the new information that we have about keels, which moves us beyond the work of Kermode and Marstrander. The excavations of Peel Castle in the 1980s uh, produced a structure which was, uh, it was suggested, part of a monastic site. It's the right sort of size for, for one of these keels. And the stratigraphy unequivocally shows that the, the building was built on pre-existing burials and the cemetery continues after construction. So there's a, you know, with the following wind I think we can say that we have got clear modern archaeological strate strate stratigraphic evidence that shows that, that we have keels and burial grounds together uh, in, in certainly some cases. Chris Morris's excavation at uh, Keel Vale uh, in Druidale in the late 1970s uh, went uh, a stage further in uh, recovering a building which was built in two phases. It was strengthened by thickening the walls and it also produced in that later masonry uh, a total of five simple stone grave markers. Tantalising though, though, despite very careful uh, investigation of the surrounding area, no graveyard. Um, that's uh, resisted all searching and uh, indeed even after the site was destroyed in the uh, construction of a, of a reservoir which prompted the, invest the investigations in the first place, still no evidence for, for graves. That, um, that kind of uh, uh, example has been um, replicated by my more recent work at, uh, at Lagnacilia, where again we have a site which is um, uh, a structure which is in, uh, has two phases of construction, and indeed where again in that later phase of construction we have three uh, stone crosses, um, very, very simple grave markers incorporated into uh, the masonry. Burials in this case are present, and this site now has a total of 10 uh, carved stone crosses, uh, which makes it second only uh, to the monastery at Mackold in the northeast of the island uh, in terms of uh, the uh, crosses produced. We do at last now have some science uh, relating to our, our cemeteries and 
Uh, two sites in particular have been investigated, and what's uh, extremely interesting with both of them is that we have, uh, we have sixth century uh, radiocarbon dates for both. So the, uh, there are elements of these cemeteries which are very early um, in, the, in Western Britain, if you like, for, um, for a Christian burial. But I'd like to turn to the keels as a phenomenon in the landscape. Up to now, I've looked at uh, two out of 17 of the parishes in some detail. You'll see uh, here I've, uh, the, the keels are marked in, in green uh, dots, and uh, you might just about see that there are some red lines on that map. I'm afraid it doesn't show as well as it does on my computer. Um, what you will see, though, is that, uh, is that the distribution is very much in the lowland, in the farmland, and that they, uh, they're not in the uplands, characterised by this uh, heather moorland through here, nor indeed are they on the, uh, the peripheral or marginal farms. They are on the core farmland, the, the high status farmland. If we strip off that aerial photograph, we, we can actually see this a little bit more clearly. Um, what you, uh, I'll do the numbers for you, there are 29 land holdings there, of which uh, 12, uh, you know, more, than, uh, more than a third, lack a keel. So, Marstrander, I'm sorry. Um, what you will see, however, is the frequent peripheral nature of the location of these keels towards the edges of these land holdings, and that's uh, that's a, a point which Chris Lowe drew attention to back in the 1980s in his uh, PhD thesis from Durham. Now, because of work I was already doing coincidentally on uh, routeways through the landscape, my attention was drawn to the accessibility of these sites as reflected in the modern road network. We see here. Um, again, I'm not asking you to look too closely on that because we'll focus on some um, on some case studies. I'm afraid it really doesn't come out too well in the colour. Um, but what I also did was to add in minor routeways, uh, routes which would come down to us now as perhaps public footpaths, rights of way, that kind of thing, or indeed uh, trackways through farmland. We have a very well-developed idea on the island of public rights and access to land. We don't have a right to roam, as you find in large parts of the British Isles. Um, you very much do have public rights of way, public footpaths, which are the only places that you can, uh, you can go. And once I drew these in, it, it, uh, it certainly changed the, uh, the picture. But let's look at these in some more detail. Like the Killian, the site I've already mentioned, topographically incredibly out of the way, but actually a great deal more physically accessible, as this, uh, this highlighted public right of way uh, shows. And indeed, there is local folk tradition that the routeway continues further <coughs> south. Um, this is one of those rare sites where there is, uh, there is some folk, uh, folk reminiscence that, that burials continued into the 18th century on this site. And think of all those uh, burials and crosses that we have uncovered from this site already. Only a little bit further north, um, we have, uh, we have two, two sites here and here which are potentially accessible, you might think, from this uh, road. This is the modern road, though. They become even more accessible once you tra trace in um, the old routeway that ran just to the seaward um, and uh, which passes directly next to, to all of these sites. This, this routeway is, is defined by the field pattern rather than, than crossing it. We also have the third site at uh, Kilpori out here. Uh, it's in the middle of nowhere until, until you appreciate the public rights of way that exists through there and then the minor roadways through the, through the fields that, that lead past or up to it. A little bit further north again, the site of, of Raby Keel here. Uh, a whole series of uh, 
footpaths that lead through this, this farmland to the sea. And if we strip off the, the aerial photograph, it becomes clearer. There's, there's perhaps the remains of an alternative long distance route that's running through here, which predates the, the existing modern main road. And lastly, the site of Balakanen Beg, where again we have a site which is gloriously uh, isolated. Forget the, the modern main road here, we know that that's, that's uh, of, of 18th century date. The older routeway led along the ridge line through here. That is still preserved in part by these public rights of way. Once you factor in the, the small trackways through the fields, you really do get a sense of, of, uh, of how accessible these sites are. Now, I can't at this stage prove to you that these sites are all, uh, these, these routeways rather, are all medieval in date. What I can show is that many of them respect the boundaries between landholdings, sometimes even occupying liminal and peripheral space between those landholdings. I most certainly can show that those landholdings are medieval. Which leads me to a conclusion that uh, perhaps we need to consider one issue which up to now has simply not figured in discussion of the Mount's Keels, which is quite simply, how did their users access their faith? How did they, for instance, very practically transport their dead to these burial grounds? You need these routeways, you need this landscape to provide that facility. And I would suggest, just simply with uh, a few examples here, that quite frankly the answer has been in front of us all the time in the landscape and in the pattern of the landscape. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Oh, yeah.